Hello and welcome to this week's Friday Forum Live with me, Sarah Glazer. As regular viewers will know, we broadcast every Friday from Point Blank Studio here in East London to bring you exclusive tutorials, artist interviews and the very latest industry insights. Joining me today is alternative acoustic electronica duo Lisbon Kid, who will be deconstructing their track We Look at the Stars, which features vocals from St Etienne's lead singer Sarah Cracknell. Remember, you can find out more about our courses in London, Los Angeles and online by visiting our website, pointblankmusicschool.com. Oh, hi. Joining me today at Point Blank HQ are Soho-based Portuguese musicians and producers, Danny de Matos and Rui de Silva, who have joined forces to form the mighty Lisbon Kid. Individually successful on both sides of the Atlantic as award-winning writers and producers, the duo released their self-titled debut album, A Wall of Sound, to critical acclaim. Hi, Danny hi. and Rui, thanks very much for coming Hello. in. Um, right, we're going to start... Um, uh, yeah, we're going to start talking about whose idea it was to come together and form Lisbon Kid, because you both come from quite different musical backgrounds. Yeah, I spent most of my time writing for different people and producing mainly in kind of indie alternative artists and music for TV ads and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Rui obviously had a pretty strong career in the more sort of dance area of things. So we do come from different areas, but I think we complement because what one is perhaps weaker on the other has got more strengths in and um, yeah. and also I think we both I think what happened was that we were both looking for something else to do that took us out of what we were actually known for yeah I mean r r with Rui in particular he described it once as spending his life making records for people to listen to at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and now, I guess, um, from my point of view, it was I'm less worried about um, making records that rely on the latest haircut. Yeah. You know, and it just and we just wanted to make a record that was a lot more sort of acceptable to people, and, and make a record that we had more control over. Because when you work with and for other people, generally um, the parameters and the briefs aren't necessarily yours. Yeah. And one advantage that we had in making this record is that we could decide exactly what the direction was going to be. And that, that happened really organically, really, really quickly and easily. Well, that's what I think anyway. Okay. Well, Rui, yeah. what time of the day do you feel you're writing for now? Um, any time of the day now. I used to, to do a lot of um, club tracks, so dance music, mm. and um, just a little bit restrictive in, in creativity to go into other um, areas. So. This project allows to to expand into um, other fields that I've not had a chance to do before. Fantastic. Okay. And where were you when you wrote this album? Because I know that you're partly based in Portugal and London. Mm. Well, we both in both sides actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Li in Lisbon, yeah. uh, Zetel as well, and um, in um, in London, yeah, in Soho and in Windsor. Windsor yeah. Right, okay. And um, what was your mindset for writing it? Did you start off with a particular idea? Um, very, well, there's, there's loads of ideas that, that, that form into tracks, but it was kind of a, a coming together of my background and Danny's background and the fact that we're both Portuguese and tried to put, uh, put that into, into yeah. the music. Yeah, the sunshine and the warmth. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely there. And the sea, I think, actually, seriously. Yeah. Just thinking about that now, there's a th sort of thematic thing there about, and maybe about discoveries and new worlds and stuff. Ah. Like that. The Portuguese are really known for that, you know. Oh, of course, Vasco da Gama going out there. Yeah, and, uh, and Miguel the and Empire. all those <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so not that I'm kind of saying that we're kind of discovering it to that extent. But yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. I think I think there's a there's a sort of lot a big organic element to the sort of the electronics that we're doing, mm. and where we use. Um, we can get into that later, but we use lots of different ways of achieving that. Okay, and you probably wouldn't say no to uh, world domination with your music anyway, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think whatever that is these days, <laughs> it's sli slightly fractured these days, but yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so what gear did you use when you were putting this album together? Um, quite a lot of stuff actually. Um, a lot of just some 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 guitars from Danny. A lot of. Acoustic styles. instruments like guitars, bass, mm -hmm. um, and also 
some little like uh, music box machines and and then of course harmoniums a, a, a plinter of plugins and sound libraries and uh, found sound recorded yeah. recordings kind of like what 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 was just the electronic and acoustic stuff hmm. so uh, a strong blend of things yeah i mean literally stuff that was lying around i remember needing some um kind of felt that one of the tracks needed some sort of, sort of interference yeah and i remember making a cup of tea and noticing there was a brilliant packet of hobnobs or something <laughs> and as i picked them up there was this sort of scrunchy sound i thought that'd be really good for one of the tracks so we just took the packet into the into the booth and just recorded this sort of scrunchy grit and it sort of ended up after we edited it a bit sort of glitchy and and it's difficult sometimes to achieve that with you can spend hours and hours doing that with a plug-in and with yeah you know uh, you know different ways of generating those things and white noise and this and that and sometimes it's good to actually put your hands on things and actually do that especially with found sound and stuff there's quite a big element of of foley if you like on on mm -hmm. the album which is a bit unusual maybe for for records these days i guess you know i mean some people like like uh, John Hopkins and stuff are, are doing that, but we, we like that kind of um, stuff that's non-musical to come outside of um, a, a, a Big Mac or a, or, a, or a you know or a laptop. Yeah. So do you hear music everywhere then, just walking around down the street in every little sound? Yeah, I mean we you know we did like Rue says we did a lot of found sounds. We you know if we go to the beach for for lunch when we were in Portugal we'd. Mm -hmm. We'd record the waves and record, you know, kids playing and stuff like that. And um, we didn't necessarily know what we'd use them for. We, we were down in the tube and recording the tube arriving and leaving and stuff. And then sometimes we take those recordings and um, and mangle them really. Mm. Yeah. You know. In fact, there's a there's a music box on one of the tracks. Is that under the rainbow that we used that one? Yeah. And uh, I played the music box forwards. Yeah. But not necessarily in a linear way, like starting and stopping and stuff. And then that track came about because I just decided to reverse it and then put got a big delay and, uh, uh, on it and um, actually a big, um, I think it was even Tide's Black Hole or something like that mm. we used on it. And just completely mangled the whole thing and it, that became a different musical thing. Yeah. You know? So we like experimenting with stuff like that. So it's, so we're, so it's the true definition of being acoustic electronica, so that you know the, the guitars that we use are quite. You know, we've got some some nice vintage things that you know we really care about the importance of, of the sound of things. So yeah. we'll use whatever it takes to achieve that. You know, rather yeah. than be kind of really formularized in in what we're going to do. It's got to be in the box, or it's got to be out of the box, or it's got to be this plug-in or that plug-in. Mm. Just whatever works really. Yeah, whatever sounds good to your yeah. ears. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the songwriting process, do you have a more traditional approach, such as starting off on, on keys or on guitar, um, before you move on to production, or are you tackling both processes simultaneously? I think it depends, really, really. Yeah, yeah. I think it really depends. Sometimes you might you might come from an idea of that doesn't exist. Sometimes you might just come from a lyric that Danny already has, or it might come from a sound, or might come from something that we heard, or an, a, a song from someone else. That kind of triggers the the process. I think it always starts with a, some sort of idea, but it never comes from the same place, and then kind of like evolves and goes. Sometimes we do a, the session together, other times just like back and forward. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. And that was I was going to ask how the collaboration process works in terms of who does what, or are you, are you both having a, a go at all the different elements? It's not really defined, to be quite honest. I mm. mean, yeah. most of the most of the mixing was perhaps done um, at, at my place in. In Berkshire, but then um, you know I'll work on something, send it to Rui. Um, he'll work on it a bit, send it back. Um, we have days or weeks where we block out and just do do this. We've been in the studio for um, a couple of weeks at a time, just working on things. There isn't a defined way of doing it. I think that that it's these days is the, the new kind of model, if you like, way of making records you're able to do that in lots of different places. And if you take the approach that we take, where some of the input of the sounds that are happening are literally sounds that are around you, yeah. um, then 
that's fine. The bu main bulk of things in terms of you know acoustic guitars and and basses, uh, live basses, all that kind of stuff was done at, at my studio in Berkshire because purely because that's where that stuff is and it's yeah, impractical for sense. us to move stuff. We've yeah. moved stuff play abroad before. We've you know done gigs in you know Cannes and Lisbon and what have you. And moving stuff around these days is very very expensive. Yeah. So we've got a set up in in Portugal. Uh, which is kind of a lot more minimal than we would have over here. Mm -hmm. And we've got a set up in Soho and we've got a set up in Berkshire. And we work between the, the three places. The one in Portugal is actually probably the most mobile because it's the smallest, you know, mm -hmm. the monitors are smaller, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's only like one or two guitars and things. But over here, I guess the main bulk of track laying gets done here. And maybe the main bulk of writing gets done in Portugal, maybe. Mm, yeah. Uh, probably exactly. That's probably the way to, that, that we do it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, right, well, let's have a listen to the track. We look at the stars. Lovely, good work, good work. 
Uh, so yeah, in terms of creative workflow, what's the first thing you're doing when you're making a track? I guess this one in particular, how did you start? I think it starts with, uh, with an idea. Mm. And th it always, um, or as a sound or um, some, um, some small um, uh, beat that got put together or chord progression either by me or, or by Danny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then just evolves usually one of us does a, a little seed for the for the track, some idea, and then sends it over to the other one mm -hmm. and say, what do you think? And then either it gets used or discharged, but a lot of the times it gets used and we end up start evolving it, mm -hmm. like growing it slowly Yeah, yeah. into, well into uh, a track. Sometimes those things might not necessarily be musical, though. Right, like okay. For this album, we've collected a load of music from other people. For mm -hmm. we're, working, we're working on our, our next album now, and we've collected um, a load of images. Oh, really? Because yeah, because we work quite um, cinematically, and yeah. what the uh, the album as a whole, from beginning to end, there's kind of a cinematic feel to it because it's kind of written to images. Every track has its own video, anyway. Yeah. Um, so we really think that the aesthetic is really important now, and artists need to think more and more about that. I mean, if you think about what we're doing today, um, it's not just an audio feed, there's a visual thing as well. Yeah. People, people need to be enveloped in that. And I think that artists need to think about the, the, uh, the visual aesthetic of what they're doing. And in this particular case, uh, that informs the music as well. So we don't have, we yeah. have image. It just helps us to guide something. And I think that's probably an influence of me working a lot to picture and doing music for TV ads as right, well. Right, okay, so you're used to that process. Plainly, because mm. the TV ad is that what's on the image, you're writing to bespoke for that image. Yeah. And so that informs the music. And in that same same way, sometimes it's bits of video, sometimes it's chaos and magazine, JPEGs that we've, that we've got lying around, and that influences what we do um, as well. So did this one start with an image, this track? No, I think, I think this actually started um, with just a little arpeggio thing, really, it was. I mean, it sounds completely boring, <laughs> but it, but it was just a, like a little arpeggio that that we. I think we jammed this one, if I remember rightly, and then it built from there. It was just put the idea was put to the side, um, and then we kind of thought that it it suited a sort of sonetian sort of sound, mm. um, and when it was finished, originally it was the idea was that it was going to be an instrumental. Oh right. Yeah. Um, and we'd uh, played it to Martin Kelly, who looks after Sonetti and has done for years from um, from Heavenly Records. And mm -hmm. He thought that um, Sarah would be really good on it, and um, we thought that, like, it was a great idea. So we got Sarah involved, and um, yeah. okay. that's how she ended up on it because it was more like that sort of thing. The album's quite eclectic in its its feel. So, um, and this happened to be one of the tracks that that suited her voice. Yeah, so you, did you know her beforehand then or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how did you meet her initially? Well, funnily enough, Sarah is from, <coughs> uh, is from near where I live. And oh. it, when, we were, <laughs> when we were all kids, there were people like um, Johnny Mail from Republica, Andy Weatherall, uh, Tim Dorney from Flower Up in Republica, Sarah, myself. Um, there's quite a few people that are in the sort of same sort of area that have gone on to to do things, and I, I knew Sarah from, from that, from her early kind of local bands and stuff. And yeah. then, obviously, we've um, we've known each other since that time. And she then joined Sonetti, and Sonetti had done a, had a long and um, very f fruitful career. And yeah. I, her husband, actually uh, published me um, for a project that I did with Sony Columbia recently. So um, there were connections there. So it's just mates, really, just a bunch of mates yeah. getting together and doing stuff. Very handy mates to have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said it started with an arpeggio. I mean, did the do you start then with the um, with the drums or the synths or the live elements when you're building it? What, what's the process there? What the next step after that? Yeah. Well, uh, as, uh, as we uh, as we're saying, it depends on 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 the track really. Uh, uh, you know, in the past, Rui has been messing about um, on a uh, on a keyboard and found uh, a progression that he likes. He'll send me that. Other times, uh, you know, I'll have something written um, that's musical, and other times, because I come from a sort of more traditional songwriting school, I actually write um, uh, lyrics and melody to something that I want somebody else to sing and send that to. Mm. In this particular case, the arpeggio just lent itself to to more kind of little 808 kind of small programming, 
Yeah. Uh, I think Rui did some of that. Yeah. Um, sent it to me, then we decided to work on it together. So the process is, is very collaborative, but it takes time. Yeah. Um, and what a lot of people perhaps, or a lot of people viewing this won't really fully appreciate is that quite often when you're making a record, it's not the, um, and I'm talking about an album really, yeah. you're not really talking about the 10 or 11 or 12 tracks. Um, we overwrite by a factor of two to one. So oh, right. Yeah, so there'll be lots of tracks that aren't used that mm. might may mean that they're the basis of something else. Even if the tracks are completed, you know, you're only going to get 10 or 12 on an album. Yeah. So the process is that you might have 18, 20, 24 tracks, which are then scythed down to make the album. And it's not necessarily the best tracks, it's the ones that fit together as a complete piece of work. Yeah. So there's always an artistic intent in everything that we do. It's not about banging out singles. Mm. It's not about um, using every track that, that we work with. It's about making an artistic statement with it so that there's a flow from the beginning to the end of the album. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Okay. Um, have a little look on my questions here. So how did you write with Sarah? Did you send her a fully produced backing track that she wrote top line to or? No, she came, she came to, the, um, to the studio. She came to the studio, oh, yeah. Well, 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 after she heard the track, uh, and after the manager heard the track, we just set up a day. She came to the studio. We played the track a few times. We, I had some sort of melodic ideas. Yeah. I always try and do that in case the session's awkward and ugly if people aren't coming up with anything, right. just as a backup. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just uh, when, you're, when you write songs for and with other people, you do that quite a bit. So uh, I don't necessarily present them uh, immediately so that you give people the chance to have a creative input, obviously. Sure. But if those sessions are becoming sticky, then you have something that already exists. In this case, we kind of relied about 50% on that. We did end up recording that day, even though it was a writing session. Um, and then re on reflection, about a week later, we both decided that what we've done was pretty rubbish, really. <laughs> so, and that happens. Yeah. So, um, we decided not to proceed with that. She came back a, a week later, and with about 20 minutes, we'd, uh, we'd got everything, I think, written and recorded. Well, perhaps not recorded, but it's definitely written within 20 minutes and recorded within an hour. Fantastic. She went home. Thank you very much. Everybody's happy. Yeah. So, she came up with the lyrics as well. Uh, yeah, that was that done collab collaboratively. Yeah, Sarah yeah. Sarah writes too. She does, mm. you know, in Sanetian, That's very much a collaborative um, project, just like uh, just like Lisbon Kids. So yeah, she's got her own input into that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what effects have you used on her voice in the track? Can we isolate it and uh, mm. have a listen? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, We've got you can quite a lot of. Um, it's probably an overload of effects, <laughs> as usually. Yeah. Oh, it's too many. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this some of the stuff here is. Revoice Pro, that was, we kind of time aligned, we used Revoice Pro to time align um, the d double track with the, with the lead uh -huh. to make it really tight, just sound like one voice. But so she double tracked it when she revoiced yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Revoice Not necessarily all of it, but it's a bit of it. And then um, right. Revoice Pro is used in a, lo a lot for, um, for ADR. Mm -hmm. It's something that we talk about sometimes yeah, in composing yeah, film and TV. Just channeling into yeah. another program, but it's, that was kind of like offline processing. But Mm -hmm. We just add uh, an EQ, shaving a little bit of the bottom end here, mm -hmm. and a little bit of the mud. Um, going into um, uh, 76 compressor, then um, going into um, every road kind of clone of a desk, just to give it a little bit of EQ yeah. colour. Can then we have a listen just to the vocal, like sort of as you're doing this? So yeah, we can. Uh, we can. Yeah, that would be lovely, thanks. I don't want to sleep. And then de -essing. There's no need to speak. Um. Just pitch correction is that was just for um, before we tuned uh -huh. a line of a little bit stars. of um, 
exciter for um, the vocal. Perhaps we can listen to the others as well in context. The uh, yeah, the I can put the whole vocal. Mm. Yeah, that'd be great. It's some. Just look at the stars. So we've got a little bit of Just like an if um, processing effect that we did by using um, some um, uh, like we call it a, shim a shimmer, which is yeah. kind of like. Um, I don't remember how we created this because I so think I think things. that was actually that was actually <laughs> black delay hole, yeah. uh, even tied black hole or Valhalla shimmer itself. Yeah. So what it's actually doing is the reverb um, delayed, is actually being that the reverb is actually being pitched up. So you get this harmonic that's effect. Yeah, chorus almost yeah. back yeah. to yeah. it. Yeah. So that's why it sounds as though this is like a synth line going in the yeah, vocal. Yeah, it does. And yeah. so we just use that on the last word. So the last word is stars. stars we look yeah. at the stars, we look yeah. at the stars. So the word stars is going through a shimmer-like reverb. Mm. Specifically, I think that in this case it was a black hole. And that black hole reverb gives you these, these harmonics that are uh, on the reverb itself, and the reverb itself is quite, it's, I mean, black hole, people that will know it will tell you it's huge, mm. it's enormously clean, and it's synth-like and bell-like, mm. and uh, that's how and we did we, that. Yeah, I so think we've got double, yeah, we've got, we've got like a, a layer of vocals, it's just doing like kind of a paddy as a BB. Oh, yeah, how did you turn them into that sound? That's really interesting. No, th this, is, this is not uh, Sarah, this I think is Denny, is Denny? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just sang a load of um, a double tracked a load of yeah. This and this has all been aligned, so yeah. it just sounds as one. Yeah, left and right again through the, uh, Revoice Pro. You don't want to get it absolutely the same because then ultimately that would just double the the um, the amplitude. But it's um, it's uh, aligned so that there's no phasing issues and stuff yeah. in a way that doesn't affect phasing. And in terms of the, her spoken bits, you've brought that kind of really close to the, the ears of the listener. What did you I use to do that? Um, I think we did put it through an amp. Yeah, Disney just a little amp, speak. like a simulation, which you actually got a, a real one in the studio of this one, but we kind of used uh, digi the digital version just for practicality. Yeah, I mean, if, if plugins give us what we want, then yeah. we tend not to um, worry about um, we're not sticklers for authenticity on the level of um, just for the sort of on the hardware or, or beard stroking about it. it but, you know, we in this particular case, yeah, Sarah did record really closely, but the kind of sound we were after happened to be in Logic in their Tweed amp. Thing. Mm. I mean, like I said, we've got um, a nice collection of amps as well in the studio, and the yeah. Blues Junior um, Tweed version is one of my favourites. It's a bit. Anaraki, but the Tweed version has got a softer speaker, and for vocals that works really, really well. So there's no harshness, mm. but it was it's a null point really because the plugin that comes with Logic that everybody can have tomorrow mm -hmm. works really, really well with a, um, a ribbon one to one setting on there, and it's it was it was perfect for that. So it doesn't. We're not proud about or particularly. Um, uh, insistent that we work a particular way. It's like yeah. whatever sounds best. And in this case, the plug-in yeah. was best. Yeah. yeah. And what mic did you use when you were recording her? I think it was a Neumann. Um, a Neumann, that would have been, was it, she was recorded in Bach, so yeah. that would have been a TLM 103, yeah. <laughs> which is basically half a U87. Yeah. So it's it's one, so it doesn't have... Um, it's it going doesn't into the Avalon, is it? Yeah, and that, yeah, and that went from, from that into an Avalon uh, VT737 SP. Uh, we use an Avalon, we use um, Neve 1073, yeah. uh, I mean controlled that, by 1176. That's thing, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing we kind of like, um, are very precious about is um, the path to record the sounds into, into, yeah. the, ah, into okay. the, um, yeah. the digital workstation. So we've got a lot of care and attention to on that by Having the right microphone, the right preamp, right compressor, and then yeah. uh, some some good um, converters. And once it's in digital, then most of the time is going to stay there until the listener listens to it again. Yeah. yeah. But we need to make sure that the, the the going in has to be very carefully selected. Okay. I mean, it's an old sort of garbage in, garbage out um, <laughs> uh, philosophy, really, as far as that's concerned. Like Rue says, once it's we digitise it. 
it remains in digital generally. I mean, I don't think in this case, I think we did a test once where um, we took stems out and the stems were summed and those, those sum, that sum was recorded. And to be quite honest, for whatever reason, I, we don't really care. Um, it didn't sound as good as it being bounced internally. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because the extra noise that, that was generated, the harmonic distortion, it wasn't mixed like that. So you're, sometimes you introduce things that are more uh, noise and degradation that's more positive, and in this case, the output for our ears was much better. Uh, digitally. I mean, a lot of people won't like that, but you know, it's the truth. I mean, I know we know that recently, uh, people like, uh, fortunately, people like uh, Andrew Sheps agree with us. You know, so right. um, it's something that we've been doing for, for for quite a while. You know, it doesn't mean that we won't mix or, or or do stuff outside the box, but if we do it, it's got to be for the reason that it sounds better, yeah. not from a philosophical. Yeah. Standpoint. So you it's know. about the integrity of the sound. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. I mean, we're as much gearheads as anybody else, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, but I guess, but but we're not precious about how things are achieved. What we care about is the final output. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Is the final output better? And then we'll we'll use whatever mechanism it, it takes to achieve that final output. Great. Okay. Um, so in terms of instrumentation, the song features acoustic guitars. Um, What's your recording process for that, and what gear do you use? I think you mentioned something about Portuguese guitars. Out there. Yeah, there this is one? there is a, a guitar which is sounds like a Portuguese guitar, mm -hmm. but it was actually achieved by playing a different guitar that wasn't a Portuguese, which is actually. And so, for those of us who, who don't know the difference between Portuguese guitar and a regular well, guitar, a Portuguese guitar is kind of like a lute. Uh -huh. um, if you Google it, you'll see that um, it's tuned from the top in kind of a fan tuning. It's a 12 string, mm -hmm. um, really small, sort of short scale. Um, and we achieved that. We've got one of those, but it wasn't, um, for one reason or another, the strings were old, it was really difficult to find, and we had to finish the session. So what we did, um, I've got an old Takamini 12, which we used the capo on really, really high up. Yeah. I mean, I'll I can't I'll remember what number it is. So yeah. people really know oh, what yeah, the sound yeah. is. Yeah. That's all that part is doing. Yeah. I mean, but it's like, there's quite a few things that we try like to, and, and this is a, a, an, um, an acoustic instrument played by, by a, a human being, so it's always, mm. the timing is not always going to be human, so yes. we try to make it, in this case, we try to make it almost like if it was an electronic thing, so we quantize it, so it makes it sound a little bit more different than you would expect. A, uh, an acoustic instrument to sound okay. because it sounds mechanic, but it's played by by um, a person. Yeah. So that's one of the ways that you balance the um, you know, the live yeah, instruments with the Yeah, we try to, the to take it from sense, from yeah. the from its comfort zone, even the the sound, and move it into a, uh, an area that you wouldn't expect it to happen. So that's just always trying to to new creative ways of mm. of using the sounds. Yeah. Okay. Any tips for recording guitar? Yeah, get the best guitar you can. And a good player. I mean, really, yeah. and, and, a good, and a good player. <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's the thing. I know, but seriously, I mean, uh, we've got, th there's a particularly nice guitar that we have, which is a 1956 um, 018 Martin, small little parlour thing, but because it's so old and the wood's so dense, it really rings out yeah. beautifully. And that is, uh, the, an example of a philosophy which is what you put in has to be the best possible mm. because then even those small incremental things make a difference. Now, if you haven't got um, access to that, I mean, quite often live, we will, I used something called a, a Fishman Aura which, um, box which works with uh, the Fishman um, under saddle pickup in a normal way, you would imagine, like any other pedal. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, is that the sound image that you use is matched to the guitar that you have. So what they do is they record, for example, a 956 018 Martin. Yeah. And then they record the output from the um, pickup of that. And then they take away the output from the pickup from the mic recorded, leaving you with a sound image, which they then apply. So basically, mm -hmm. that kind of thing 
we will use that sometimes for expedience if it sounds good. If not, and I think in this case, this was just done in the booth with a, mm -hmm. um, a small capsule KM84 type, if mm -hmm. it wasn't a KM84, at the 12th fret pointed directly to it. Um, that's okay when there's two people right. doing it. If mm -hmm. I need to record a guitar quickly, um, we sometimes do a lot of you know TV ads and things, then then expediency means that you might use a box or something, something that fakes it yeah. a little bit more. But it, for, for, for in terms of this album, we always try and take the best um, sonic audio route possible yeah. because it's going to stay. Okay. And um, how do you balance the soft synths with the live instrumentation? What are your tricks for doing that? Mm, I mean, you need kind of like the both, uh, but um, it, 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 there's no... No tricks. It's just um, it's bringing like it's like making sometimes the um, the soft instruments sounding more human by moving it from being so much to the grid and then bringing a, a live recording, making it more mechanic by making it tighter to the grid. So it's just a just um, experimentation and see what works best. I, f I think also that sometimes if you use things like foley, which sort of externalise that sound. Um, and they bring uh, an organic ambient element, literally, ambience. Uh, it suggests a particular ambience. That kind of can take away that sort of a sterile electronica thing. Mm, yeah. I mean, in terms of balancing, uh, the, you know, the, the question of balancing electronics and acoustics, yeah. we don't need necessarily to balance that. Uh, that I think that happens organically with, with, with the sound. We, there's a... There's a concerned output that we have, um, and we've talked before about um, having those ideas um, that are perhaps also visual. And I guess the, the two things together are achieved by having the final output idea. Yeah. And that's how we try and do that. Okay, so it can vary track to track then in terms yeah, of having more yeah, or yeah. Less yeah. You need uh, to be flexible in, in every record that you're making, um, especially those people that want to work uh, with and for other artists. Mm. You know, it's not good to have a fixed approach to what you're doing. I think with it, electronic musicians in particular, they um, are so genre focused that, you know, uh, they have to be, they have to realise that if, you know, if you're making a record with, I don't know, writing for somebody like Adele, that you know, trying to do poolside house is not going to really work. She so might want a new direction at some point, though. She might do. <laughs> she might do, but she's kind of doing okay with what she is at yeah, doing at the moment. Shabbily, yeah. Yeah, not, not too shabby, yeah. Not too shabby. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's just about the best, the best technique or the best sound for the job. Simple yeah. as okay. that. And that relies on, obviously, on good judgment. And I believe that the way to make that good judgment, and it's something that me and Rui still do all the time, every day, is just we just listen to loads and loads of music. Yeah. Our music collection, in fact, our DJ sets, um, uh, in, in predominantly in places like Ibiza and stuff, you know, we will play Pink Floyd and we'll play Keaton Heston and uh, yeah, we'll play Claptone and we'll play whatever, but it, it's quite wide because our mm. influences are wide. Yeah. And I guess that's translated in, in the album, which itself is quite a wide. So you're constantly thing. listening to new music as well. And yeah, getting, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because we, you can't help but be influenced by that. Mm. That is what music is. Music, you, and your music that you make, you are a product of the music that you listen to. Yeah. So if you listen to a wider range of music, then your music, uh, I think, benefits from that because you take from loads of different things. If you look at the history of even of something like drum and bass, you can mm. follow a piece of string back that goes back to, to dance halls in, in Jamaica. Um, yeah. And so if you listen to that music as well, then you can bring those influences into your music. Um, and that's how new genres are created. They're f it's fusions of, of music. That I aren't, those fusions aren't kind of rammed into together uh, 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 forcefully, but mm. they happen organically from people listening to loads of different music. Yeah, it's the best way to time travel. So Absolutely, like, yeah, yeah, definitely. different elements. I, yeah, I yeah. love it. I um, didn't quite yeah, think about a cosmic spin on it like that. Really <laughs> right, yeah. um, what's your favourite instrument or sound on this track? Uh, for me, it's definitely this guitar. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was... Um, it's kind of like one of the strong features on on, on on this on this track. It's kind of, for me, it's the main 
the main thing on the on the track is is this guitar the way mm -hmm. it got recorded the way we manipulated the sound from to try to sound like something else and then and then ma make it quite uh, mechanic the way that I was played yeah I'd have to element. say I'd have to say Sarah's voice because if I don't, she'll slap me. <laughs> 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 so that's my favourite always. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, in terms of drum programming, uh, mm. what did you use, and what was the most challenging aspect of creating this lovely laid-back summary beat? Um, I think this this one was actually not too too complicated to create. I think we did um, uh, listen. I'll play with some bits. Can mm. we solo the drums? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drums. we can solo the drums, that'd be great. Yeah, we did put recorded a shaker. It's, it's quite very light percussion and, and drums. And it's got a little kind of like... Um, That's obviously eight, really mangled eight 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 loops. 808 eight kind of sound. I think it mm -hmm. actually might be a 6 or 6. Is that with a ring modulator on it, that loop? Um, I think I it is. I don't, I don't know. Sure. Has it been printed, that? Yeah, it is printed. I I'm not sure exactly what was... Yeah, this yes. is all this heavily processed um, drum, so... Mm. This is the bottom Yeah, this is kind of like um, the same the same era as an 808, but it doesn't sound like an 808. Probably 6 or 6. So what have you, what have you used on it, didn't you? Um, we just compressed it, probably to death. Yeah. <laughs> That is, um, just I think that's an 808 style kit. Yeah, and the then program, and then the program has gone through a ring mod modulator. It's been compressed. It's mm. so we've used that. That would be one of the pieces that we had to use on this particular track. Yeah, Quite often, what we do is build an arsenal of sound stuff that's going to go in. Yeah, yeah. And we, and then there's some more percussion coming in here. So this is like a little classic. Um, drum break. Mm -hm. So do you have almost like a sort of scrapbook of drums that you start out with and then just sort of pop yeah, them in and, and see what works? Um, a mixture of uh, programming and vast libraries that we collected over the years from set from disused things from other sessions yeah. to things that we kind of acquired, like, like everybody can uh, going online getting some sam sample libraries mm -hmm. from our record collections that we might sample something, but. Not not too much, otherwise you get in trouble. <laughs> and um, yeah, just to whatever. It's I think it's important for you to be very familiar to the sounds that you you have that you own, like all your libraries, your mm. your music collection, and your and your uh, uh, instruments. Then you can you know when you're working on a track, you go, you know, I know what we use. You need to be able to go and get it, otherwise you yeah. always rely on the same instruments. And we have we have created. Um, samples if you like so we've done programming and played bass and what have you and guitar and then mangled all of that to make it sound like a sample yeah we've been mm. asked before where are they where's that sample from and we tell people that we i mean we, you know we've got we've got those the stems of that those original sessions so that sometimes there'll be a session for making what sounds like samples yeah, yeah. Uh, you know with vinylizers and distortions and saturation all that kind of stuff because um, I, I think we, I think it's quite we quite enjoy the process really, and I think mm. that's that's the there is I think with anybody that makes music there is a sort of that anarchy side of mm -hmm. of 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 you and enjoying the process, um, and that's the reason why that has happened I think on a number of mm. occasions. Rui in particular is um, is really into that sort of thing, so he'll mm. spend hours doing that kind so of thing, coming up with What would you say are the advantages of doing it that way around as opposed to, to using a sample? Is it just because you've got more um, control over it? Yeah, because sometimes a sample does, has got the, um, the sounds in the wrong place or in the wrong key or sounds that you don't need. Yeah. So what you want is, usually it's, it's, we, we go and grab it or create a sample to, to give some sort of character mm. identity to the track, so process the sound in a way that uh, that you make it sound like an authentic thing that comes from a certain era, 70s or 80s or 60s. So you program the beat with the, the sounds that that um, people would have access to uh, in those days. Yeah. So a lot of it comes from, I've got a very close producer friend of mine that does a lot of sound, sound replays. So mm -hmm. he's, he's a, an expert in creating something that sounds authentic. Yeah. And I've kind of like 
we got inspired with that to create to, to use some of those techniques to create some samples Fantastic. And, and keep away from legal <laughs> hurdles as well. Yes, we don't want those. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe wouldn't appreciate that, no. So, um, in terms of mixing, what's your mixing process as a geo? Do you do it yourselves or do you use a, a mixing engineer? No, we do everything ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. On the first album, we kind of like end up mixing most of the tracks on top of the, um, the writing uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. And it's something we've been discussing because we start writing now the second album, which is completely separate the production. Because there's a, there's a writing stage, then we've got um, the production stage, and then you've got the mixing stage, and we're now debating to move and separate the, pr the finishing of the production to the mixing. Right. Completely, yeah. So you can yeah. have much more control and focus on, on the mixing. And, and I think that will probably give us another 10 or 20% more quality on the final product, mm. which is something that we're always trying to kind of improve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in terms of um, the future, what new releases have you got in the in the pipeline? You said you're working on the second album already, is that right? Yes, yeah. we are. Well, new, new, is, in fact, this single is out today. Yeah. Okay, buy it's it, out today. buy it. Or was <laughs> out. We've got some really brilliant mi mixes from Howie B. Oh, yeah, Howie actually. B's done, yeah. Howie B's done a great Fantastic mix. remix. Uh, he's, um, he's always been a hero, so, you know, with the U2 and Bjork stuff, so he did a really good mix. Mm. And yeah. um, we've got Warriors of a Discotheque. Warriors of Discotheque, the yeah. Out of uh, Ireland. From Ireland, yeah. yeah. Ireland and America, yeah. And, and Spatial Awareness. Spatial and Awareness as well. We've and and we've done a remix yeah. as well for the, for the release. Great. But um, yeah, coming forward, we're still going to put a few more singles out with remixes on from the album. And uh, we're working on um, album number two, mm -hmm. which is the, the writing process is dependent o on uh, our agenda is to be able to go to Portugal and right. write a bit more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of like at the moment um, looking at planning the next year. So when can we actually go there together mm. and do some writing? Dreaming of the beach like we all are. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, we, we literally go to the beach yeah. to write <laughs> and then come back and, uh, and write a bit more. Cool. Um, so we're going to take some questions now yeah. from our, our lovely viewers. Um, so the first one here is from Paul Lucas who asks, when recording environmental sounds, what kind of miking techniques do you use? We use, I've got a Zoom, um, quite H4 old one, yeah. H4, yeah. yeah. So basically use that most of the time. It's mm -hmm. got inputs for uh, external mics and I've been considering getting um, a shotgun mic, but... Um, 416 or something. Yeah, yeah, but at the moment I don't have one yet. So mm -hmm. I use that or um, if I don't have that, I'll use um, whatever I've got available. Sometimes even yeah. with the iPhone when... Uh, oh really? Yeah. But yeah. The sound is not so brilliant, so I, I like the the zoom. And we talked earlier about scrunching packets of biscuits of and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that sound, I can't remember what track that's on now, but that sound was done, I think that that track, yeah, that was done on an iPhone. Really? Yeah. Because the mm. quality isn't that important, it's about a character. Yeah. And even with the sound of the fridge in the background or whatever, for these sorts of things, that isn't so important is whether you can impart the, that particular character of that confusion that glitchiness and that was completely fine but as Ruth says generally you know a, a, a zoom h4m which is like commonly yeah. used for uh, for found if, sounds if we are if we're in, on a field if we're at home then we'll, we'll or in the studio we'll, we'll use um like the mics that we've got around or something but yeah. in but fact we've recorded things with the the neumanns just in the yeah. booth right yeah yeah so it, it really depends, yeah. Yeah. but um, I think the, the, the Zoom has now we've got a, was it, a was new that, one. Was that guy's name Paul? Was that? Uh, yeah, his name was Paul. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I think the f maybe what was after is like, what shall I use? Mm. We use a, I can't say what you should use, but maybe we use a, a Zoom H4n. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, um, people like Rode, people, there's very loads of different people actually do um, <coughs> found sound type, you know, stereo mics for the iPhone. I know that. Yeah, mm. blue doom, road doom, um, and the quality that you get is fine. Yeah. It's uh, if okay. it's going to be used in that context. I wouldn't, you know, record an acoustic guitar and a piano with it. But no. um, <laughs> you know, but for that sort of thing, yeah, that's completely fine. So whatever's mm. to hand, really. Yeah. So for all your biscuit wrappers, Paul, that's what you need to do. Yeah. Um, so Hovsep um, is asking whether the drums are sampled or whether you've recorded them especially for this track. Um, the drum beat. Uh, the breakbeat, it's actually a sample, mm -hmm. um, 
that um, drum machine is actually programmed. I can't remember now which one it was that we used, but it's probably uh, samples on on um, the machine drum from uh, from Logic. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Vlade um, is asking how you process the sounds catching from the surrounding environment. So I guess he's talking about found sounds again, like the lovely um, seagull and beach yeah, noise I think at the beginning. Yeah, a lot of the times we kind of embrace what's in the recording, so we kind of look for the recording. And maybe um, most of the time we'll clean up a little bit the bottom end because there's a lot mm. of rumble that always comes through the microphone yeah. and Wind kind of takes, microphone. takes mm. headroom on, on a track. Mm. And um, but if there is um, some weird noises or something, a lot of the times we just let it stay there. I might enhance it by by um, like overdoing compression or mm. or um, expansion, just manipulate it into something that starts kind of like sitting in the track. Mm, nicely. It's actually so embracing it. Yeah, yeah. most yeah. of the time it's the the ear guides us where we we need to go as mm. opposed to 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 do what is supposed to be correct. I mean, I think mm. it's important to, to recognize that sometimes if, you know, if something needs to be compressed um, or whatever, you can, and we're talking about, say, a, a, if for sake of argument, a loop of a load of seagulls and then one particular loud seagull, there's nothing to stop you copying the file and going into the file and changing the gain in that particular part of the region. Mm. You can do things that way as well. Um, if you introduce by doing that, glitchy bits and pieces. If that's appro uh, appropriate, then that's fine. It might mean that what you have um, is rhythmic that's working against the time of the track. So what you've got might be, for example, generate some kind of idea that it's five beats, going into a four beat track, a four four track, that might actually work to your advantage. So mm. it's difficult to answer that specifically. You've just got to do what's best by being able to, if you like, A&I yourself and step back from from the process and understand exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve by the sound that you've, you've captured. Yeah, okay, it's so a mixture of experimentation. And yeah, uh, yeah, of having course, yeah. Idea of Okay, um, so we've got um, 15th sign is asking um, if the vocal, oh, is vocal doubling technique the only way to create thick sounding vocals? Um, no, I think you can use a bit of saturation sometimes. Mm -hmm. One of our favourites is Decapitator. Mm -hmm. Love it. Sound yeah. toys. Um, or even just Echo Boy with uh, no delay and um, and full wet and you just go through the all the settings they've got for for different p um, echo machines and that gives a, a nice saturation and then you sh most of the time we we might blend that in parallel just because you've got more control yeah. between both signals as opposed to to use a, a wet dry um, the setting yeah I mean, I've, got, I've got to say that in terms of doubling vocals the w best way to double a vocal is to record two vocals yeah, yes. because sometimes <laughs> when you use things, like even uh, even things like you know Santoy's uh, MicroShift or uh, things like that, um, you get this effect that just basically sounds you're recording in a really really bad room with a close reflection, and it's not going to do your recordings a lot of good no. at all. Mm. Um, just you know, record, 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 edit, get a master, and then what's left, um, edit that into something. We, as Marie mentioned before. Uh, quite often we'll use something uh, called Revoice Pro, which is really used loads yeah. in, in the ADR industry to to make sure things um, match time-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, fricatives, yeah. S's, T's um, need to be really, really close. Otherwise, you know, a word like post, for example, ends mm. up going post. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of post processing, no pun intended <laughs> afterwards, um, but that's, uh, that's what uh, the best way to do it is to actually do it. Yeah, um, if you if you want to make it sound like one one single vocal, uh, using um, Prevoice Pro is a brilliant software. That yeah. mm -hmm. what used to be taking hours to do manually, now you can automate almost hundred percent. Not hundred percent of it. You still need to go manually. Yeah. Correct some small things, but um, you can layer five, six, seven, eight vocals, and it sounds like one. Wow. Yeah. So it's brilliant. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Kinky Disco. Um, how did you focus on artistic intent and flow of the album? Um, does a single track form that basis? And uh, how do you continue to re-envision the sound with your other tracks without getting uh, distracted? 
Okay, I'm not sure I completely answer the question. <laughs> uh, uh, I can, can I completely answer this question because um, I'm not sure I understand it. Well, do, so can we do it one, at, one part of it at a time? <laughs> yeah, so I think that asking, um, so how you focused on your artistic intent and flow. So I guess that's your key idea for the mm, album and yeah. then how you avoid getting sidetracked from that. Okay, well, because we've made a lot of records and a lot of records for different people, mm. we do have a pre-production process before yeah. we start a record. Mm. Before we started this album, we've only just begun the second album, although it's going to be, I would imagine, um, at least, I, I guess, eight, nine months before it's completed, probably. I mean, yeah. singles might come out before that, think, but um, yeah. but we, we it, there's a pre-production process that includes uh, things, like I said, um, it's earlier, like a mood like board, mood board in, yeah. in, in a way, okay. where you might have tracks that, uh, on this track, I like the fact that the way the hi hats are, or on that track, I like the mood that creates the in 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 when I listen to it, or that picture might create something, or that bit of video, or that bit of uh, dialogue in the movie, whatever. Just create a mood board. I mean, and the important that, thing yeah. there is that it's not it's not just audio that we're using. Yeah, we're yeah. using video and we're using pictures to create that artistic intent, yeah. and then that helps maintain your focus on that particular track and the album as a whole, because you might have pictures and audio that run as briefs, as inferences. And these, like I said, this comes from our days working for uh, doing music for, for, mm. for TV ads, which are always based on a written brief, um, a, a visual brief, yeah. and an audio brief. So yeah. these, so we have, we collect references for the album as a whole, and then references for each track, which are based on the bigger references the bigger folder mm. if you like of the album uh, uh, as a whole okay that's how yeah. we maintain the focus yeah, yeah. getting organized and, and yeah. restricting yourself yeah. to it's worth doing that people yeah, it makes sense. too often people rush into switching on the their computer and getting mm. into banging out some beats yeah. that's, that's why it's important an idea mm. to start yeah. with yeah and cr and this this mood board in, in the end what creates is an artificial limit yeah so you kind of like you've got almost like a little garden where you can do your thing on this project. If you want to do something else, create another garden. Yeah. Yeah. You know? The yeah. restrictions can be quite a fun challenge. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Um, we've got Jason who's uh, in Canada. Um, he's asking about the um, the high end of your kick. He's asking if it has a stereo effect um, and whether it's parallel processing with low in mono. Rui, have you um, seen it? I'm not sure Good luck. what we've done. <laughs> <laughs> there is um, so the kick, you're saying the kick mm. has got a parallel? Yeah, it, is a, it appears the mid-high it. end of your kick has right. a stereo effect. Wow. Is that a parallel processing of low and mono? I He's been listening closely as well. Yeah, yes. yeah. I think it might, it might, <laughs> I think it might be to do with, with um, either the pre-processing of, of the loop. Because it's, it's, it's um, too, too... Perhaps if we... Um, I think it might be to do... I think what she's actually hearing is the snare um, wobbling a little bit, yeah. Yeah. rather than the kick. I can't see the stereo here, but we haven't done no no MS um, compression no. or anything. Right, it's showing up as very mono there. Yeah. What stereo is that? Kind of like that ring modulation is perhaps what he's talking about, yeah. and that is affecting predominantly. That was from the, the, the drum loop, end. Yeah. yeah, the drum yeah. loop from previously, yeah, rather than the the, the the bottom end, which ten, you know we tend to keep. Since you know, as he will know, the bottom end is um, not really that directional. You know, mm. There's no point in um, giving it too much. The stereo bases are mostly a gimmick, in our humble opinions. Okay, cool. We've got time for one more question before we uh, wrap things up. Um, so go to Yash, um, who's asking... Can he borrow a fiver? Well, <laughs> 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 no, that'll be me. <laughs> so every artist would suggest um, a way of, of finding your sound and making your music. Um, how did you find your sound? I think we found our sound by bringing what each one of us um, mm. strengths have got onto the, onto the table, mm -hmm. and kind of like um, bounce back and forward, but always with. I think he also before we even recorded a single note, we kind of like we're in Portugal and we 
kind of like spend an afternoon just discussing ideas and where where we where would we, we imagine this project? Mm. Drank a, f a few bottles of Portuguese wine as well. I was going to ask you <laughs> if any alcohol was involved. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then from there we kind of like took that on and um, start create creating bits and sending things back and forward mm. and try to find it. I mean we cr the all all this is created by it's but um, we also let a little bit of um, um, space for it to develop mm -hmm. in, in its own way. I mean, you sometimes know, all these artificial yeah. limits is just to be able to allow us not to be lost or stuck. Yeah, But yeah. that doesn't stop us uh, removing it and moving further. Yeah. I think yeah. there's an important um, definition here that perhaps people forget um, when people are, uh, are with and at places like Point Blank. When you work professionally, um, there's a kind of different thing that's going on there because your time is really really important mm. so you want to try and make things as efficient as possible yeah if you're doing it and trying to when you're trying to establish yourself and when we were both were trying to establish ourselves you know which is uh, you know about a thousand years ago um, <laughs> I'm sure we you know we would spend ages and ages and ages on track and uh, maybe go about things the wrong way because we could afford to uh, meander down um, alleyways and reverse up cul-de-sacs and change <laughs> our minds loads of times and end up with loads of unfinished tracks. Crashing into lampposts. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, with, with professional people, you'll ten tend to find that there's less unfinished stuff right. because of what initially might seem as some sort of uh, pretentious argument of having boundaries that are set up by references, be they, uh, as we talked about, audio visual or you know uh, and but but actually that saves a lot of time yeah it's our time's important to us mm -hmm. and the time and quality output ratio has got to be uh, maximized as far as we're concerned so we try and do that by taking approaches that give us the best bang for buck and the mm -hmm. and and I don't just mean from a, a f it's not really a financial thing it's an output thing. It's like the best output, so the best techniques to get the best output. Yeah. And sometimes if those techniques mean not working, mm. that is if the mix isn't going anywhere and you're wasting your time just yeah. going round and round in circles, then stop what you're doing. Yeah. Quite often, you know, we'll be in the studio and we'll realise that we're looking at the screen too much and not using our ears. So mm. we switch the screen off, go and make a cup of coffee, leave the track mm. running and then we'll understand what is going on. Because yeah. you can get too focused into something, look at a load of fibres and discuss each individual fibre. And if you don't actually step back, you won't realise that what you're actually looking at is a horse. Mm. Mm. And see the bigger beauty of what it is that you're trying to achieve. So over-focusing can do that. So those are, these are just strategies and techniques that we've learned over the years to, to be able to balance up, to get the best output possible. Mm. So working in an intelligent, mindful mm. way yeah, and absolutely, trusting yeah. your ears. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. great. Well, thanks so much for coming in, guys. It's Thank a you. real pleasure, pleasure to have you. Um, yeah, so sorry to say that we're all out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. Um, obviously, you can find out more about our courses through our website, pointblankmusicschool.com. We hope this has given you plenty of inspiration for your own music making. And uh, yeah, you can follow Lisbon Kid on Twitter at Lisbon underscore Kid. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can follow us at point underscore blank. Thank you very much and goodbye.